thank you all for, for coming and for taking your, your seats so promptly as we're on a tight schedule. My name is Nat O'Connor and I'm the Director of TASC. And we're delighted to see so many people here at our annual lecture. In this, the 10th year of TASC's existence as an independent progressive think tank. And you don't need me to introduce Mary Robinson. It seems much less than 21 years ago when her election as president symbolized a new outward looking modern Ireland. We were at last taking our place among the successful self-confident nations of the world. And despite the current crisis and austerity, many aspects of life in Ireland remain immeasurably better than they were in the past, although some inequalities remain. But law reform, economic development, social change have made things better for many people. And we can find a way of regaining our self-confidence. And part of our Irish confidence and pride should be based in our enduring solidarity with those who never had a booming economy or a bust. We're rightly proud of the work of Irish people and Irish aid organizations across the world, helping communities to develop and to attain their human rights. And even as we make hard choices about how to close the deficit with our now more limited resources, we must not harden our hearts to our commitment and obligation to the people who were truly vulnerable in the world. In her time as United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, Mary Robinson was a strong and unwavering voice for everyone in the world who suffered injustice. Mary Robinson has always been a strong advocate for equality and reform. As a barrister, senator and activist, she challenged the consensus and defeated conservative orthodoxy on a wide range of issues. Issues like contraception, the legalization of homosexuality, and women's rights to sit on juries. Just some issues, rights which we take for granted today. And Mary Robinson's work is a reminder that we do have to fight for our rights and continue to struggle to achieve equality and social justice for others, both here in Ireland and across the world. I'm sure that many of you have your own memories of Mary Robinson as she influenced thinking and shaped social change. And I'm sure many of you have interacted with her in her different roles and will support her work on climate justice. There's even a photograph on the wall in my parents' home showing my father meeting Mary Robinson when she was president. She awarded him and others a pin in recognition for having donated blood 50 times. <laughs> and my, my own link with Mary Robinson is when I went to Trinity College. My studies looked at the importance of people getting access to information in order to make democracy work as it should. And not only did I receive my doctorate from Mary Robinson herself in her role as chancellor of that university, but this represented the closing of a circle. On the first page of my thesis, I quote Mary Robinson. She made a speech in support of freedom of information in the Shannon debate in 1988. And she said, power devolves from the people to the organs of government who exercise that power on behalf of the people. Yet, people are denied access to relevant, <coughs> pertinent, important information relating to how that power is being exercised. And those words are still true today. And her statement contains two principles that motivate me. Firstly, that power devolves from the people. Our government and all its policies, economic policy, social policy, environmental policy and policy towards the developing world must serve society as a whole. And to me, that means equality and social justice. And secondly, that people are denied access to information. We cannot have political accountability or wise policy making or even intelligent discussion in the media if we do not have access to relevant, pertinent, important information relating to how power is being exercised. So these two principles are close to my heart as director of TASC. And as a think tank dedicated to equality, we're concerned that all people living in Ireland should benefit equally from economic and social policy. We're concerned that everyone should know what is being done with their money and in their name, at home and abroad. It's a cliche to say that knowledge is power, but actually it's more important to recognize that secrecy is power. We need to end the long-standing culture of secrecy that surrounds policymaking in Ireland and strengthen the democratic participation 
of everyone as we make crucial economic decisions that could restrict the possibilities available for future generations. And part of TASC's work is conducting research, making information available so that people can better understand public policy and engage with democratic decision making. At TASC, we hope to give power back to the people through our work. For example, in our equality budget work, we try to help people understand where tax is collected and what political choices are made in deciding how it will be spent. In our progressive economics work, we put forward a defense for those who are the most vulnerable and insecure during the current crisis. But we also prevent, present alternative models for how our economy could be transformed to provide a more equal distribution of the benefits and to provide sustainable solutions to climate change and resource depletion. And in our work on governance, democracy and reform, we make the case for better corporate governance, stronger parliamentary democracy, and more openness and transparency in government. In total, we have six research programs and a wide range of projects, large and small. And there's an information sheet outside on the table where you can see more about what we're doing. And in that context, I'd like to thank those who make our work possible. We don't receive money from the state. We're reliant on philanthropy, donations, and sponsorship for our work. So thank you to everyone who supports us. And thank you especially to those of you who will make a donation tonight. There's a, an envelope there and a, a box outside if you, if you can, or through our website following tonight's event. Tonight's annual lecture is one of our projects designed to share thoughts with the public. In the annual lecture, we try to create a space and put aside a couple of hours to take a broader look at equality and related issues, both locally and globally. Previous annual lectures have been delivered by Lara Marlow, James Galbraith, and Professor Kathleen Lynch of UCD. We are delighted that Mary Robinson agreed to give the 2011 annual lecture and speak about her latest endeavor. Tonight, we will hear about the Mary Robinson Foundation for Climate Justice. Climate justice is rooted in the principles of solidarity, equality, and human rights. We need to have solidarity with our neighbors in Ireland who may be living on a low wage or no wage, but we also need to have solidarity with one billion or more of our neighbors in the world who are now facing the devastating effects of climate change, which threatens their ability to survive unless we act. But our guest speaker will tell you for herself how important this issue is. Please join me in warmly welcoming Mary Robinson. Thank you very much, Matt, uh, for that very thoughtful introduction. Uh, as I was listening to you, you seem so young, which means that I'm getting older, you know, <laughs> an elder. But uh, it's good to hear these views expressed. It's very good to be with you in Tashk for your 10th year. A 10th year is a sign of sustainability. Uh, you've lived through different times, and now this is probably a very important time for you. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm really very happy with the timing of my talk to Tash this evening, because a lot has changed in Ireland over a very short period, which should encourage you all in your work. And before addressing you on my major topic, I'd like to reflect briefly with you on this. A successful state visit by Queen Elizabeth II brought to a new level relations between Britain and Ireland. This was emphasized by the words of Antishuk and also of Prime Minister Cameron, who spoke of a new way forward with emphasis on trade and on cultural relations. Meanwhile, the death of Dr. Gareth Fitzgerald during the state visit gave a much deeper context to what was being brought to fruition as we were reminded of the contribution he made over many, many years towards peace in Northern Ireland and to necessary change in this part of the island to make it a more inclusive and fairer place. There was the inspirational address by President Obama reminding us, is Fager Lynn? Uh, they tell me that now in Washington DC, everybody's saying is Fager Lynn, you know? <laughs> All of these events together have changed the public mood, changed 
the public mood and lifted our collective morale. There's a sense of pride that the public events went so well and showed that Ireland can hold its own on important occasions of national and international significance. At a deeper level, I believe, there has been a period of inner introspection by Irish people from all walks of life, reflecting on the images of the state visit, on the speeches of President McAleese and the Queen, and the speech by President Obama, and above all, above all, pondering the many tributes to and accounts of the life and values of Gareth Fitzgerald. The fact that they were linked together was a huge gift, I think, to all of us, because it gave us a particular context. It encouraged us to think and to internalize what was happening and not make it superficial, but actually quite deep. Countries do go through moods or fashions of the time. When I was elected president in December 1990, the mood in Ireland was one of local self-development, the spirit of metal in towns and villages and parishes. We were becoming more prosperous and welcomed the inward investment to Ireland and the return of talented Irish people who were coming back to make their futures here uh, with us. Sadly, a short time later, many were caught up in the hubris and to a large extent greed of the Celtic Tiger period, where the excesses of a relatively small number in banking and property development brought our country to its knees. Since then, and really until the last few weeks, we've tried to cope. We've tried to cope filled with seething anger and quiet despair, combined with a sense of humiliation about the loss of our economic sovereignty. It has not been good to listen to the radio or hear views. We've been really down, and it's been a sad time and a, a really difficult time for everybody, and particularly for those most acutely affected. None of the grim economic realities have changed, but the public mood is capable, I believe, of having a life of its own and helping us to change our circumstances in a more positive way. The values that guided Gareth Fitzgerald throughout his life are fashionable again and instructive to many young people who had become cynical and disillusioned. In a number of articles in recent years, Gareth was criticizing the inequality and unfairness of our taxation system and funding of education and other issues that we needed to think about. This, of course, is also, as we heard from Nat, the agenda of TASC, that TASC has been committed to, the pursuit of equality, economic, social, and environmental, in its vision of a better future for Ireland. Recent events have propelled us in this direction and provided us with an opportunity which mustn't be missed. We should take to heart the recent critical report on Ireland of the UN's independent expert on human rights and extreme poverty, Dr. Madalena Sepulveda Carmoda. The report criticizes the Irish government for seeking to reduce the budget deficit by imposing deep cuts in public spending while, maintain, while maintaining a relatively low tax rate, as these are likely to have a major impact on the most vulnerable in society. Dr. Carmona also calls on EU states to reduce the interest rate charged on Ireland's um, uh, under the EU IMF loan. She notes that cuts to the Human Rights Commission, the Equality Authority, the Ombudsman for Children, and the National Disability Authority budgets have substantially reduced their capacity to protect the most disempowered in society. She reminds us, and I quote her, human rights are not a policy option, dispensable during times of economic hardship. It's therefore vital that Ireland immediately undertakes a human rights review of all budgetary and recovery policies and ensures that it complies with human rights principles. I'm delighted on your 10th year and in a full room and with that sense that 
we have a common bond in this room to commend you for remaining true to an agenda of equality and social justice. And I would really encourage you, and I hope this evening will encourage you, to re-energize, to feel, yes, now we can get going again. We've had these hard times, it's been difficult, but we can collectively really recharge our batteries, re-energize ourselves, and capture this more positive, values-led public mood. We need to be innovative in thinking of the policies and approaches which will make us a fairer and more equitable society. Much of this will, of course, depend on government policies. But we know from experience that our lives can be affected, really can be affected, by the general attitude in the community around us. Can we revive again a conscious sense of proactive community self-development? Can we rekindle the spirit of metal in practical ways that Im impact on the lives of those worst affected by the current crisis? My sense is that is happening at local level quite a bit. It's certainly happening in County Mayo, which I know a little bit about, because that's where our permanent home is. You hear it in that neighborliness that has come out again, but it hasn't been gathered in in a way that TASC, I think, can, can highlight. There are resources in every community that could be harnessed. And I think we need to think about starting with education and jobs for young people. We've seen the high unemployment figures that are unacceptable. There are resources in every community that could be harnessed to provide mentoring, training, job experience, opportunities. What about the service providers and carers who've had their budgets cut? Is there an interim way to provide support from the community itself? Let me quote brief words of Deepak Chopra, whom I've met a few times. Some of you may have read his work. Um, this is a brief quote, but I think it's a very relevant one. He said, the possibility of stepping onto a higher plane is there for everyone. It requires no force, effort, or sacrifice. It involves little more than changing our ideas about what is normal. It involves little more than changing our ideas about what is normal. So I would encourage TASC to give leadership in thinking about how individuals and communities in Ireland can change their ideas about what is normal in ways that reach out to and support those who are hurting badly, who are desperate, who are losing hope. I believe that there's a moment in time, a shift in public mood that we can build on to change our ideas of what is normal. In addition, we'll need innovative thinking, really innovative thinking, if we're to develop in Ireland a low carbon economy which is fair and sustainable. As the saying goes, let's not waste the current deep economic crisis we're in, but use it to propel us to be at the cutting edge of a real transition which affects all aspects of our economic and social life. And I do believe the task is well placed to stimulate new thinking on this. Which leads me to my major topic of how we, ha we have to have a global low carbon economy which is fair and equitable. As well as working towards greater fairness and equity in Irish society, I believe we have an opportunity to give leadership on one of the greatest human rights problems and challenges of the 21st century, the way in which climate change is beginning to undermine the livelihoods of some of the very poorest of subsistence farmers, of indigenous peoples, and slum dwellers in poor developing countries who have no responsibility for causing the problem. How do we address this issue? but also ensure that poor developing countries can achieve climate resilient green economies. They too must have the right to develop in an appropriate green way. This is what prompted the establishment of the Mary Robinson Foundation Climate Justice, which for those of you who might be interested after this, you can find at www.mrfcj.org. We may be going through tough times in Ireland, but some of the world's poorest will suffer even greater deprivation because of the carbon-based development we benefit from in Ireland. So 
As Ireland transitions to a low carbon economy, which we need to do and should do, poor developing countries must also have access to green technologies that we take for granted in our daily lives. We can have light and heat at the flick of a switch, clean water from a tap in our house, and food to eat just by opening the fridge. We can buy a newspaper, go online, or turn on the TV or radio, and have access to information and uncensored views and opinions. We have the right to vote, universal access to education, and the protection of the state in times of need. All of these things contribute to our collective ability in Ireland to combat climate change and plan for life with some degree of warming. I'd like to explore with you some of the ways in which these things create a society better equipped to deal with climate change and how the absence of these basic services and rights can increase vulnerability and powerlessness in the face of climate change. Let's start with waking up in the morning and turning on a light, having a hot shower and boiling a kettle for a cup of tea. All of these actions require access to energy, to electricity. An estimated 1.4 billion people around the world don't have access to electricity. Many of them live in urban slums or rural areas unconnected to an electricity grid. If we believe in the right to development, which has been proclaimed by the United Nations since 1986, and the right to a better life, we need to improve access to energy for the poorest in developing countries. In the past, this would have meant rolling out diesel and generators to rural settlements, and maybe building new oil and coal-fired power stations to supply large centers of population. But in a world of rising oil prices, energy insecurity, anthropogenic climate change, and dwindling resources, an alternative is needed. Small to medium scale off-grid renewable energies have the potential to transform people's lives by providing electricity for lighting and cooking, and so doing without burning fossil fuels and creating greenhouse gases. These technologies are becoming more and more affordable, and their rollout to developing countries is becoming more attractive as the carbon market develops and the clean development mechanism matures. As a result of increased funding to promote improved access to renewable energy, communities in sub-Saharan Africa are gaining access to microfinance to access a range of renewable energy project projects from solar panels to improved cooking stoves. Renewable forms of lighting are providing alternatives to expensive and often dangerous kerosene lamps, allowing children to do their homework and women to make more productive use of their time. Scaling up these activities will allow developing countries to leapfrog our fossil fuel intensive model of growth and embrace the alternative, low carbon development. If you need any proof of this, I think it's the mobile telephone. Um, in every country in Africa that I've been in in the last few years, and I've been in quite a number, it's astonishing the access to the mobile telephone. Nobody has landlines, but everybody has maybe not so healthy anymore, as we've learned, but everybody has the mobile phone to the ear, and it makes such a difference with what they do with it. So let's go back now to our scenario again of waking up in a comfortable house in Ireland, switching on the light, and having a shower before heading downstairs for that cup of tea. The next assumption, of course, is access to water. We've come to appreciate our water supply a little more in Ireland in recent years, as floods, and cold weather have interrupted supply, and dry periods during the summer months have led to drinking water restrictions. Under current scenarios, we can expect to have drier summers, especially in the east of the island, and wetter winters, especially in the west, which coming from and living in Mayo most of the time, when I can, that worries me a bit. There's enough rain in Mayo, but we're going to have more. Water flow in most Irish streams and rivers could drop dramatically in summer and autumn, but winter flows will increase. While most of the water will be in the west, demand will be concentrated on the eastern seaboard. And this disparity will result in significant infrastructural and logistical challenges. In developing countries, 
where water is already a scarce resource, and many women, as you know, spend several hours of each day walking to collect water for their families' needs, the impact of climate change will make life even more difficult. The distances traveled to collect water will be greater, water quality inferior, and time for other important tasks, such as going to school, will be constrained. Access to water is a critical element of the right to development. Rainfall and ground and surface water supplies are critical for crop growth, for livestock rearing, and for industrial processing. Without adequate water, the development opportunities of a country or community are severely diminished. We know from pilot projects around the world the value of water resource management in maximizing the development and ecological potential of water. Watershed management projects in Ethiopia have transformed barren valleys suffering from soil erosion, declining yields, and outward migration into vibrant, productive, and green communities. So there are ways to address this. In South Africa and in New York, urban communities are financially rewarding upstream rural communities that leave, live upstream of the city for their efforts to maintain their environment and manage their land in such a way that water infiltration is minimized and water quality is enhanced. Decision makers in New York, where I spent eight years in New York City, were alarmed at the potential cost of a filtration plant. It would have cost in the region of four to six billion US dollars to meet drinking water standards. So they switched from an approach focused on end of pipe solutions to protecting water quality at source. Water and sewer rates from the city are now used to fund land protection and watershed management programs upstream of the city, avoiding the need for new filtration plants and providing good quality drinking water to millions of urban dwellers in New York. This approach to valuing resources and rewarding communities for practices which benefit others is also the concept that informs RED+. Plus. Now, I am not a climate expert, so if I'd been sitting in the audience and somebody said RED+, plus, I would say, what? So I'll tell you how it's spelled first, R-E-D-D, -D, and then the plus sign, obviously. And the R-E-D-D -D is a major global initiative to reward forest communities in developing countries for conserving their forests and avoiding deforestation and degradation. So the red stands for, um, I've gone blank, um, uh, reduction of emissions from no deforestation or forest degradation. How about that? Just got it. <laughs> the world's major forests in the Amazon and Congo basins and in Indonesia play a critical role in absorbing CO2 from the atmosphere and their destruction is a significant source of greenhouse gas emissions. So Red Plus is an evolving system which allows developing countries to pay, developed countries like ours, to pay forest countries to protect their forests in return for carbon uh, credits. And this new approach to recognizing and rewarding the actions taken by some forest communities for the common good by mitigating climate change is a core component of a fairer or equitable global society. We're learning new ways to pass credits for good conservation work in forestry from the rich world to the poorer world to help livelihoods in those poor countries. So back again to our morning cup of tea. This is a very prolonged breakfast, I know, but let's, let's stay with it. Back to our morning cup of tea. A slice of toast would be nice and perhaps a bowl of cereal or milk. Food, an essential part of every human being's life a key component of the Irish economy and globally, a very inequitably shared resource. In a major report published this week, Growing a Better Future, Oxfam has joined with Concern and many others in warning of mass hunger over the coming years over rising food prices. It seems that climate change is already affecting food production in some parts of the world. In Malawi, the growing seasons have become so unpredictable that farmers don't know when to sow their seeds. And often when they do, their crops are destroyed by intense rainfall, floods or drought. Feeding a world population predicted to reach 9 billion by 2050 will be an enormous challenge. And climate change adds another dimension to this challenge. 
How can we increase the use, improve access to food for all, and at the same time, find ways to reduce the emissions produced by the agricultural sector? We'll need to find new ways of doing things, informed by local and indigenous knowledge, married with the best science and research. Ireland, I hope, will have a major role in informing this transition. So, assuming we have our tea and toast, we might like to enjoy it while listening to the radio or reading the newspaper. A free and open media in Ireland means that we have access to information, debate and opinion, all of which inform and enrich our lives. We can read about the expected impacts of climate change on our community and the rest of the world. We are exposed to the debate between climate scientists and climate deniers. And we learn about national and international policies to address climate change. I have to say that despite this information, we in Ireland remain relatively ill-informed about climate change impacts and responses in Ireland. And it's not a major issue and wasn't a major issue during the recent election or previous elections. Compare this with countries in the developing world where climate change is an election issue. In Bangladesh and Guyana, climate change is an issue both government and society are very well versed in. There's an active debate on how best to manage flooding and reduce the impact of cyclones in Bangladesh. And a central part of this discussion is how to pay for these adaptation measures in a country, a poor country, struggling to meet its development objectives. Development strategy has engaged the public in plans to attract financial support from developed countries through efforts to reduce emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, red plus. Funds are now flowing into Guyana from the government of Norway in return for carbon credits generated through the preservation of forest resources. These funds are starting to be invested in priority adaptation projects and in providing access to renewable energy for rural and urban households. Media debate and public access to environmental and budgetary information are proving important forces to shaping that country's engagement with Red Plus. And while freedom of expression is a powerful force in shaping responses to climate change in Bangladesh and Guyana, and I hope increasingly here in Ireland, not all countries are so forthcoming with this right. An open society with a free press and active public debate can assess and debate the threats posed by climate change and the adequacy and appropriateness of responses to it. However, in less free societies, where freedom of expression is suppressed and access to information is limited, the poor become even more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change due to the absence of information and their inability to influence decision making. Time and again, participation and consultation have been shown to be powerful forces in shaping responses to challenges and in planning for the future. It's no different for climate change, where those most affected need to be actively engaged in informing planning and decision making at local, national, and international levels. So continuing on my theme of looking at things we take for granted and their role in achieving climate justice, I'll move away from the tea and the toast, because actually they've gone very cold by now, and address two final issues education and social protection. In Ireland, we know the value of education, but it's in Africa that I have met people who truly value education. Grandmothers responsible for the education of 10, 11, 16 grandchildren whose parents are dead because of HIV and AIDS who are struggling with this large group of young people and who have one wish for their grandchildren, that they go to school, gain an education, and create opportunities for themselves. And the quality of education matters too. We need to equip our children and young people with the skills to live in a climate-affected world. We need a new breed of urban planner who can design sustainable cities resilient to floods, and agronomists with the skills needed to modify well-developed farming techniques to a new set of environmental conditions, and they are coming forward. We're linked in MRFCJ with the Alliance of Innovation of Trinity and UCD, where I found some really interesting research going on. We've also been to Manouf and Belfast. We'll be in Cork shortly. We're in an open source 
with the research that's going on in the country. And some of it has huge implications for developing countries. So this is why in MRFCJ, we're placing an emphasis on introducing the concept of climate justice to first and second level students and to finding ways to integrate climate justice into a range of disciplines ta taught at third level. It's also why we're mapping climate justice related research in Ireland to better understand research which can help to inform equitable responses to climate change and to develop green technologies that enable a transition to low carbon, climate resilient development. In Ireland, we place a strong emphasis on the importance of research in shaping our economic recovery. But there's also an opportunity for this research to shape a new development paradigm based on equity, justice, and sustainability. Climate justice has it as its core the need to protect the most vulnerable. Likewise, in a fair and equitable society, there's an emphasis on protecting those most in need and ensuring equal access to opportunity. In Ireland, we do have a social welfare or social protection system which acts as a safety net in times of stress, illness, unemployment, or bereavement. In addition, extreme weather events such as flooding can cause, which can cause damage, which can damage property and livelihoods and necessitate interventions by the state to protect those affected. Most developed, developing countries don't have a formal system of social protection, relying instead on community and family networks and traditional coping mechanisms such as selling off their livestock temporary laboring or migration. Recently, countries such as Ethiopia have started to pilot and roll out social safety nets. Eight million people in Ethiopia are part of the Productive Safety Nets program, which I had an opportunity to hear about when I was recently in that country. It provides food and cash transfers on a monthly basis in return for work on community projects. Many of these projects have climate change benefits for example, improving soil conservation, planting trees, and improved management of water resources. As the impacts of climate change multiply, the factors that have already made people poor and vulnerable, the role of the safety nets may well increase in importance and become an important part of an effective adaptation strategy. It may be a way, in fact, of providing access to green technologies through the safety nets program. If we apply the principles of social protection at a global scale, protecting the most vulnerable to build a more equitable society, we're once again in the field of climate justice. We have many reasons to protect the most vulnerable from the impacts of climate change. Because we cause the problem, and they are most affected. Because we're part of a global society and are highly interdependent. And because we're morally bound to help those less well off than we are. These are good reasons to act, to make hard decisions, and hopefully to make the right decisions. In Durban, South Africa, later this year, the nations of the world will have another chance to commit themselves to a framework for a more just global society, where real steps are taken to avoid dangerous climate change and to support developing countries to adapt to the impacts of climate change and reap the benefits of low carbon development. There's a real urgency in this, as a report which you may have read just this week by the International Energy Agency warned that greenhouse gas emissions increased by a record amount last year when they should have been reducing. And the chief economist of the International Energy Agency said that he was shocked at this news. I don't like the sound of that. It strikes me that we need to link more effectively policy and action here in Ireland and at the global level. Many of the principles that inform your work here in TASC for a more equitable Ireland also inform MRFCJ's work for a more human-centred and fair response to the issue of climate change. So I would really encourage you, as you move into your next decade, to explore how your research and awareness-raising activities can encompass these global issues as well and forge a role for Ireland as a leader in climate justice at the international stage. And I'll just end on a, a personal note. Uh, when I became a grandmother for the first time, and my eldest of the four grandchildren is now seven, 
I had a, an immediate sense that I was recalibrating my sense of time. Suddenly, I cared about 100 years hence, because that would be his potential life. And I cared deeply about 2050, when, in fact, my four grandchildren will be in their 50s. What kind of world? It doesn't look great at the moment. It looks very, very uncertain. And it's a question of all those other children that are the same sort of age in our world today, where, in fact, we have more and more young children because our population is increasing so dramatically. But somehow, maybe a, a sort of a response of somebody who is fortunate enough, as I feel, to be a grandparent. I no longer think in terms of 10 or 15 years. I do think of 100 years. And I do think in particular of 2050 and all the predictions that we've heard. And I believe that we need to align whatever we do in countries, particularly in countries that are developed at the moment and have benefited from carbon development with the need to urgently align ourselves with the futures of developing countries. And that really is the key message of the Mayor Robinson Foundation Climate Justice. You've been a great audience to talk to. I'm dying to hear your questions. Thank you very much indeed. Just, you talked about the production of energy in other sources as being a, a place where we can show leadership. I'm just wondering, how do we encourage nations to use less resource? I think Japan was very um, showing a lot of leadership in their crisis with the tsunami and mm. cutting back on all their usage, you know, mm. out of crisis. But, but until we all change behaviours, mm. I'm just wondering how we do that. Just really three observations. Uh, firstly, I would translate your reflection on upstream to being an extraordinary metaphor. I would um, couple this with the focus on education that you have so frequently talked about in this matter. I think it is important to attend upstream. And for me, that would be to attend, above all, to the education of the young. I loved where you ended. And I would think that in all such movements, we must constantly hold an intergenerational focus. That all moments in the human journey and all stances in this human condition must be involved at this time. And I think we each, in whatever point of this journey we are, have a contribution. And I think, again, people must be educated to that. And finally, somebody hugely interested in the faculty of the imagination. I believe, as does David Hume, that what we image is what we get. And I would really coax and encourage that how we image our future is that we image it positively. I am not sure that images of doom are hugely empowering and enabling. Thank you. Um. You spoke of a paradigm shift that you got yourself when your grandchild was born um, to make you think differently about how you viewed the world. How do you get a paradigm shift for others to see the world uh, in terms of, of climate justice, to, to make people think differently about it? What change do you think we can have for that? And I didn't emphasize that so much, so it's good that you bring it out in a question. I like the way that it's encapsulated in three words, reduce, reuse, recycle. And the more we use, the more we should reduce, reuse, recycle. So if we even take that on board, and it is um, both relevant and important that this is an issue where we all have responsibility. This is not a government issue. It is very importantly a government issue, but it's not exclusively. It is an issue where every family, every community, every school, every workplace has to do its bit. And that's the message we have to get out and we have to, you know, and we have, to have um, much more encouragement um, of the way of doing. And uh, so I'm, I'm glad that your question uh, brought that out. Um, 
I thought they were very thoughtful remarks that, that, that you made, Anne. Um, that nice link of upstream and education, very much agree. The intergenerational focus, again, uh, we did in the elders that I belong to, um, so I've no escape. Um, uh, we did, before Copenhagen, join with grandchildren in discussing this to get the intergenerational dimension across just at a human level. But it is, I think, increasingly important that we, uh, that we recognize that the time scale that we're talking about is much longer than the average time scale of politicians, which is all too short. Maximum five years, more like one or two years, and maybe three, if they're really being a little bit thoughtful. And so we need to make that intergenerational point. We need to very strongly emphasize it. And I, I like the idea of um, what we image is what we get. Um, um, I think if I can come back, Paul, to your question, you know, how to make people think differently. Um, I come back again to the, to me, fortuitous timing of when I'm speaking here to Tashk, because I do believe that the mood of people did change over um, the combination of high-level images of important events and the death of a beloved figure who uh, was somebody that many, many, many households of ordinary people knew about because they had read about him, because he was a beloved figure, he wore odd shoes, he, you know, he was a very um, uh, human um, figure who represented actually the best of ourselves. And uh, he'd also lived a very long life as an intellectual in so many other ways. And he had engaged right up to the end, at the age of 85, in issues of equality and social justice. So um, I feel that um, for task as you enter your next decade, um, build on this mood. Um, it could dissipate uh, because the realities haven't changed. It's a very harsh time. We have you know, very high youth unemployment. We have people who are wondering how they're going to meet the next month's bills, the next week's, the mortgage, they're, they're you know, burdened with it. Nothing has changed in the realities. But if you have um, a community mood that is more positive, then it's more energized. And it's up to all of us to energize further that mood and to do it positively, to see the positives. I have to say, I am conscious, again, it's, it's a personal response, but I spent a number of years based in New York, focused on Africa with, with realizing rights. And because I was based in New York, I was based in a city that is full of energy, where people come down and they reinvent each other, reinvent themselves, sorry, and they, they have a lot of energy, and they say it's possible to change things. And that is what we need here in Ireland, not a false energy, a real commitment, but to have the courage and the commitment to do it and make difference. And that, I think, is, is really what we're talking about this evening, that um, uh, these are going to be very hard times over the next few years. But if we are energized in proactive community self-development, in the spirit of Mehel, in being innovative about transition, in having, above all, the upstream education to the forefront, and making sacrifices for education. Individual families have always made sacrifices to educate our young. We may, as a country, have to make some sacrifices so that our young have more chance, because that's, that's where it is now to what you had to say in it, but I noted that you didn't say anything about uh, corporations in your speech. Uh, yes, people are on board and politicians are pretty much on board, but we're going to need uh, to get corporations to stop. And I just wanted to ask, are you finding that corporations are prepared to engage with uh, your foundation? We've been going through quite the present time of the uh, financial uh, crisis. And I think it has the effect of switching people off. You know, you get so much bad news. Um, and I was just wondering, in terms of making this message uh, more accessible, in particular to children, because I think the great thing about children and watching my own children just enjoying some of their education, have you any thoughts about how you can get this message across in a more fun type of way? <laughs> I'm not a grandmother, <laughs> but I am a father to uh, six-month-old babies, um, so I also have a great deal of fear about uh, 2050 and beyond. Um, I suppose you've had a lot of experience 
um, since your presidency in dealing internationally at a high, le high political level. So you've seen the sort of obstacles and roadblocks that uh, politicians, even though they open-mouthedly support, support an initiative uh, like climate change, um, the type of bureaucratic, etc., roadblocks they can put in place. How do you think that we can get beyond those roadblocks? How do you think that we can get a real buy-in from politicians? Because I disagree with the first question. I think, yes, politicians globally have said that they support climate change, but we need dramatic change, and I don't think there's the political will at the moment to get the dramatic change. How do you think we can get to that? Okay. Thank you, the first questioner, for the question about um, corporations, about the private sector, because the 21st century, the private sector is an extraordinarily important element and has to be addressed. Um, in the context of climate change, there are at least two very different faces of uh, the private sector. There is a negative face of the coal and oil lobbies who are doing a lot of damage to the whole debate, trying to undermine, and in a way, I've, I've thought about this quite a bit. Um, the debate on climate has been understandably led by scientists and environmentalists because you know, they're the ones who were seeing the changes that were taking place. And um, the images of climate are the polar bear on the melting ice flow and the, um, uh, the melting glaciers in the distance, not the people who are suffering so much and having their development undermined quite so much. But also, scientists don't deal in 100% certainties. They deal in probabilities. So if you have a large corporate lobby, which you certainly do have in the United States, and to a lesser extent you have in Europe and some other areas, denying the science, undermining the, mining the science, buying bad science, that is a very, very negative issue. And it is happening. And it is shocking that it is happening. And they're buying politicians not to address climate as if we had an option, you know, uh, if a trade talk, um, you know, trade negotiations don't end in a trade agreement, that may or may not be serious. Sometimes trade agreements can be unfair, and it's better if there's no trade agreement. But if we don't move forward together on climate, the whole earth itself can be heavily damaged. So I actually think, um, I'm glad to see that there are more smart websites now outing some of these deniers and outing who's funding them and outing who's promoting the bad signs, et cetera. That's a bad sign. There is no doubt in my mind that we need the private sector in a huge way to address um, climate change because it's the private sector that's going to be innovative on the green technologies. And our task, in the sense of those of us who care about the equality and social justice, which is task uh, very much so, and the MRFC, uh, the Mayor Robinson Foundation, uh, our task is to um, convey to the private sector that they too have a responsibility because they are part of the problem. They have been contributing and continue to contribute to greenhouse gas emissions. They are reducing their carbon footprint. They will be full of PR, wonderful accounts of how they're reducing it. But they do have an historical responsibility and a current responsibility for ensuring that the poorest have access to technologies. So I think that's an important debate that we need to engage in. The question was um, uh, referenced the fact that we, we, we have tended to switch off and to be a bit overwhelmed by the bad news, but um, the importance of children and getting the message across to them. I actually feel enormously encouraged as a grandmother, but just enormously encouraged by the fact that children get it. They really do. It's their world, and somehow children actually get it. And I was at a wonderful event recently in the Mansion House, um, Echo in UNESCO, for schools um, throughout the island of Ireland competing for better projects on the environment and climate change. And they were buzzing. And they were, in some cases, ahead of me on the technology of how you measure your carbon footprint. And I've been showing apps and you know, apps, yes, and you know, trying to understand these bright young kids who were jumping ahead. So um, I do think that the very young generation have every opportunity. We have good green schools in Ireland. We still don't have quite enough. But I, I have great hope that, um, you know, that we need to support teachers in encouraging young people. But young people are already accessing information in the, their particular way, and they do get it, um, and they do understand that we need radical change, and hopefully um, that, will, that will influence us. 
that's maybe an encouragement to the father of the six uh, month old um, uh, children. Um, uh, there are a lot of roadblocks in the negotiations. Uh, I've been at Copenhagen, I've been at Cancun in Mexico. Um, we have made interesting progress. Um, in Copenhagen, the expectations were too high. Uh, we were going to get a FAB, a um, um, uh, what, what, what do FAB stand for? Something ambitious, fair, ambitious, and binding agreement. And the NGOs and everybody else was, and um, lots of heads of state came to Copenhagen, but there wasn't the proper preparatory work done. And so instead of that, we actually got the Copenhagen Accords outside the strict UN process, and therefore voluntary and not very helpful. And what Cancun did, under Mexican leadership, I have to say, very strong Mexican leadership, developing world um, uh, initiative, um, we got the Copenhagen Accord brought back in to the UN FCCC process. We got a clear commitment to stay below two degrees Celsius and 450 parts per million, the two degrees Celsius warming. The other day, the woman who is the general secretary of the whole process said she thinks we actually sh should go for 1.5 degrees, um, which at the moment we're not at all on course for. We're now probably somewhere between three and four degrees Celsius um, by 2050, in which case we will have maybe 200 million climate refugees. We will have water shortages across a whole band of Africa. We will have flooding in Bangladesh beyond belief. And these are not unreal, you know. So these blockages at the official level are serious. Um, the next conference of the parties is in Durban, South Africa at the end of November, beginning of December. And um, certainly South Africa has been talking about making it more people-centered and development country-centered, which is good. But we also need to take some hard decisions, which the world really has to take. And Europe, um, you know, the European Union has been on the right side of this issue and was prepared to go further in reducing emissions once a legally binding agreement. So um, I think, you know, between Ireland and Europe and developing countries, we need to strengthen um, our common ground on this. Um, at the end of the day, um, as I mentioned, you know, it's not like negotiating a trade agreement where you keep your cards close to your chest. We have to convey that this is about the future of the world, the future of the people of the world, and that they have to do it in a different way that's um, aiming to uh, reach uh, fair but difficult uh, agreement and to do it in a way that changes things. One of the things that um, uh, the Mary Robinson Foundation is doing, MRSCJ is doing, is we're bringing women leaders together um, because there is a huge gender dimension to the whole climate issue. Because if you're worsening poverty, then you're worsening the situation of women on the ground who provide the food, who go for the water, if they have to go further, if it's more difficult, um, just by the way roles are determined um, to a very large extent in developing countries. And 70% of the farming in Africa is done by women. So if we undermine subsistence farmers, we're making um, that more difficult, and we're trying to engage a sort of practical, um, strong women leaders' voice on the gender dimensions to bring out the human aspects of it and cut through some of the roadblocks and some of the um, political um, uh, horse trading that goes on, which shouldn't go on when we're talking about the future of the world. We'll do one more round. To have you here speaking to us this evening, um, not least because you are one of the elders, and as you've said, um, we do need that kind of long-term perspective and kind of global perspective, and it, it, it's really hard to hear that. I'm wondering, are you getting much feedback from world leaders as the elders? Um, the, the other thing I would like to touch on is, um, as, as has been said about corporations and economics, is in tackling this, this uh, crucial subject, and I have to welcome you having this organization on the basis of climate justice that often we, we see climate being discussed where the, the, the developing world will have to sacrifice and they have to cut back. Uh, you know, we shouldn't be affected. We all will have to sacrifice. And in many ways, the third world has sacrificed a lot. They, they need to, to gain too. So it's great to see you deal with that. But what I'm wondering is the issues around population growth, immigration, and particularly the carbon trading scheme of how we get the markets and that massive money that's being circulated around the world to get to some kind of good use and what your thoughts might be on those crucial issues. Thanks. Uh, Brian Hanrati, Gartha. 
Um, if um, you had been in Ireland uh, as a visitor on Monday last, uh, it might have seemed that the Irish had turned their back on the poor of the developing world because uh, from early morning on a radio program to late in the evening on Frontline on TV, there was a sustained attack on uh, Ireland's um, uh, official uh, aid to the developing world, uh, which is already reduced, and the suggestion was it should be reduced further, uh, or perhaps eliminated. And uh, emotively, um, the programme in the evening pitted the needy in Ireland, uh, essentially against the needy uh, in the developing world. And you, in your many roles, would have had great empathy, as so many Irish people would have, with both the, those in need here in Ireland and uh, in the developing world. And I just wonder, Linda Gussel, uh, if you had been asked your views on Monday, what you would have said. Thank you. Uh, I was glad to hear you speak about the need for a new development paradigm, and I agree very much with you on that. Now, some progressive thinkers would argue that what we need, in addition to a lot of technological breakthroughs, is also a major breakthrough in the realm of economics. We need a new economics, a new steady state economics. I'm wondering if this is con of concern for the Mary Robinson Foundation. If it is, do you see much hope of breakthroughs in this? And in particular, in terms of your emphasis on education, which, again, I was really struck by, uh, for many of us who teach at third level, we're very concerned in Ireland at the imposition by the state of a never more aggressive agenda, which is very much linked to an agenda of economic growth, which seems to contradict the need for such a new development paradigm. So I'd welcome your comments on that. Thank you. In the need for emphasis on education, I'm not obviously going to sort of um, comment on what government policies there may be. We have a, a new government. I don't feel that as a former president I should be commenting. I think as a citizen, as a, um, a person who cares greatly about this country, I can say like anybody else, um, if there's one area where we have to put huge emphasis, um, and individual Irish families have always sacrificed for the education of their young, and I think it's a point in time in Ireland where we need collective commitment to sacrificing for the education of our young. I mean, whatever that means, that we have a quality of education. It's also the best insurance for the future. It's the best insurance um, that uh, we will have um, the young population that will help uh, to pull Ireland out of the uh, economic uh, very hard times um, that we're in. The second questioner asked about um, the elders and the, and the feedback. Um, it is a great privilege to be in the company of such knowledgeable um, fellow elders. Uh, for example, Gru Brundtland is one of the elders who was um, the chair of the Brundtland Commission that gave us the whole concept of sustainable development, that we should nurture the world that we live in and pass it on to our children in good health and good standing. And she's now on a commission on sustainability that has just been reporting to the UN and that will be discussed um, in September at a very um, high level. And there are, there are others as well. But the elders, um, our current um, issues are conflict situations. And actually, I'm traveling to Ethiopia this weekend for a focus on early child marriage. So um, we're not um, primarily focusing on um, uh, the um, climate impacts at the moment, though I think we will be coming back to it. I'm glad that you mentioned population growth uh, because it comes up a lot in discussions on climate and it comes up with the juxtaposition of two wor words that worry me greatly. We need population control and immediately there is um, a very real deep negative reaction to those two words together and I've found myself now countering quite a lot in public and in conversation when population control is mentioned. It's very often mentioned, I must say, from a United States perspective. That is the worst way to look at the fact that we have and will have a growing population. There is a very effective way of addressing this, education and support for girls and women. It works. So we have an opportunity as part of the uh, um, new development paradigm to put even more emphasis on education of girls and women. And that will have a much more rapid impact on uh, the uh, population uh, growth in countries, and it will help poor countries. 
um, in a very positive way uh, to address that. Um, the conversation which I was aware of, and I must say uh, concerned about um, in the media, on um, uh, somehow uh, trying to attack um, Ireland's proud record of our identification with and support for developing countries and the fact that we do have uh, acute problems, I mentioned already, um, cutbacks in budgets for carers and for um, uh, those who are more vulnerable in Irish society. Um, I think it's important that we um, have um, a values-led approach to this, maybe adopting a little bit the values of Gareth Fitzgerald himself, um, whom I mentioned. Um, uh, we have engaged with a number of developing countries in a way that's helping them in a future course um, in their um, progress. It's not money down a, 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 a black hole. There are very real development results from this. And um, we are, I believe, in a position where uh, we can be not only proud, but also build on that relationship. And we need to do both. We need to have a more fair and equitable society here in Ireland. And we need to not just look to government, but as I mentioned, we need proactive community self-development, which seeks to address some of the inevitable um, economic constraints that we're under, that the poorest um, suffer most from. Um, but we also, um, I believe, can be uh, not just proud of, it, it is part of the texture, I think, of Irish life. It's in our DNA from our own history. But it has to be now married to the fact that we are part of the world that is contributing through the fact that we benefited from fossil fuel development. Um, we, we are contributing to a greenhouse gas emissions problem that's undermining the um, possibilities of um, uh, food security um, of the poorest. So um, uh, this issue, which I know the Goethe and others are, are extraordinarily concerned about, is going to be a major, major issue over the coming years. The rising food prices, bad biofuel development, um, which is um, either taking up agricultural land or even using food crops like corn for biofuel. These are going to be big, big issues. I hope that Ireland will be a voice on the right side of those issues as we continue to be proud of our role in development aid and that we care more for and have a fairer society in Ireland. It's, um, it's both. It's not an either or. And it's, it's depressing when it's put forward as an either or because it's, it's diminishing us rather than, you know, getting the best of us. Um, it, it's actually contrary to something which I've been very aware of. Um, poor people often give more generously than those who have much. Um, African countries receive much more generously hundreds of thousands of refugees from another country. I was recently in Liberia because I do a lot of work with Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. She was very worried about the refugees from Cote d'Ivoire, 150,000 of them. But she wasn't talking about this can't happen and I'm going to close my borders. Um, you know, there is a, there's a quality of um, humanity in poorer people. And I think to juxtapose and uh, um, have that, what I think is a false debate, is, is a bit depressing. Um, but uh, I'm not sure that it's one that I'll uh, particularly in, in, engage in. I suppose I'm already engaged in it, but you know my views now. <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm trying really, uh, I think, to, um, to encourage us to recognize one of our great strengths. Everywhere I went as High Commissioner for Human Rights, everywhere I've gone in Africa for the last eight years, Ireland is regarded as a country that cares, as a country that knows what development is about, that is on the side of developing countries. And it's something you know, that we, we have gained a lot from, and we need now areas where we can be proud of and build on, rather than um, undermine. We need more efficient aid. And more efficient is actually aligning our development aid with intelligent climate-related access to energy for the poorest countries so that they can get access to energy and pull themselves quicker out of poverty where they need less aid. And now I think I've talked enough, haven't I? <laughs>